and welcome to Disease Du Jour, episode 59. And this episode is on the topic of bandaging tips with Dr. Allison Gardner. And we have a bonus for you today. Dr. Gardner is recording a webinar to go along with the podcast so you can actually see some of the banding tips she is discussing if you want to. Dr. Gardner is a DVM and a diplomate in the American College of Veterinary Surgeons, large animal, and a diplomate of the American College of Veterinary Emergency and Critical Care, large animal. She is an associate professor in clinical equine surgery in the Department of Veterinary Clinical Science at The Ohio State University. I'm your host, Kim Brown, publisher of Equal Management. The Disease Du Jour podcast is brought to you in 2021 by Merck Animal Health. Welcome back, Dr. Gardner. Hey, Kim, thanks so much. I really appreciate you having me on today. Well, we are very excited about this. We had a great Disease Du Jour podcast with Dr. Gardner on suturing just prior to this. And in late May, we talked to Dr. Jared Williams from the University of Georgia on emergency medicine. So this episode on bandaging tips is a great finish to our emergency medicine triple crown. And as we mentioned, as an added bonus, Dr. Gardner will have a webinar to give visuals to her tips on bandaging. So you can watch the webinar on equimanagement.com on the article for this Disease Du Jour episode. So, Dr. Gardner, I'm going to just ask, you know, what your strategies and justifications are on bandaging and wound healing timeline and let you uh, share your screen and we'll start the webinar. Again, thanks for that, Kim, and and I appreciate you having me on. I've included a lot of images in this webinar just because I I have an easier time speaking to pictures. I I do want to say all of the images in this PowerPoint um, either do not identify the the animal, just the wound, or any pictures where the animal may be identified were used with owner permission. So I always appreciate those owners giving me follow up. And um, again, hopefully this this podcast can be listened to um, independent of the webinar. But if you want to see what I'm referring to feel free to to glance through the pictures. I do want to say a lot of this will be review for the veterinarians out in the field. So like Kim said, this is just more to justify the decision I making decision making I make in bandaging and to reference some of those decisions back to that suturing podcast that Kim talked about. So without further ado, let me start with this podcast. So the purposes of bandages in equine medicine are uh, for several different purposes based on where that animal is in the wound healing timeline. So initially a bandage may be placed to decrease swelling if it's an acute edematous wound and certainly to control hemorrhage. And I believe we touched on this in the suturing podcast, but uh, there are significant vessels, um, especially Uh, in the distal limb that can cause significant hemorrhage in a horse. And so tourniquets may be applied to the distal limb to assuage some blood loss while the veterinarian is coming out to the farm. It's been shown in several other animals, small animals, humans, that a tourniquet placed for an hour or less will not compromise uh, the blood flow to that that limb long-term. So that's what I'll generally recommend to my owners if they notice that one of the digital vessels has been lanced while that veterinarian is going out to try to control that hemorrhage and the bandaging. However, I do do say that if that tourniquet is placed for over an hour, there is some concern to uh, extensive ischemia to that distal limb. So bandages also support closure. We'll talk about uh, which Closures can be supported with a bandage alone and which may need a little bit more in far as coaptation. Bandages can also wick away exudate from the wound. Granulation tissue in horses is not a bad thing, but it can certainly produce a lot of the exudate that needs to be taken away from the wound. Bandages keep wounds clean. One of the major causes of exuberant granulation tissue or proud flesh is an infected wound. Bandages encourage granulation tissue, which is usually a good thing, but uh, as any equine practitioner knows, especially in a in an area of the body with lower blood supply, such as a distal limb, sometimes 
there can be too much granulation tissue. So that's that's something to be considered as to when an animal should have that bandage removed. And then uh, bandages also prevent self mutilation as as that band as that wound, pardon me, contracts, reepithelializes. There will be neuronal growth, which can cause some uh, some. I think uh, anthropomorphically some itching and sometimes horses will reopen those wounds um, because of that increased sensation. So most of the time when we're talking about bandages, we're talking about what's called a modified Robert Jones bandage. And you can see in the image on the slide, this is usually some something over the wound, um, a nonstick telfa, and then some cotton padding and vet wrap brown gauze around that. And the reason we call it a modified Robert Jones is because a true Robert Jones is usually causes that bandage to be three times the width of the of the limb, which would be a, a massive amount of bandage material for a horse. So a modified Robert Jones, usually we just encircle that limb with one to two layers of that cotton to protect the wound. Uh, one of the big questions we get is, what do you put on the wound under the bandage? And a lot of this depends on what stage of healing we're in and how contaminated that wound is. So I'll show some examples of times that I'll use a wet to dry bandage, particularly with a hypertonic saline. And usually that's to decrease edema and to provide compression just within the first 24 hours to try to get a delayed primary closure on that wound. A, uh, a wound that is producing a lot of exudate may benefit from a calcium alginate pad, um, or if it's, not, if it's not producing too much exudate, we'll just stick a nonstick telfa on that so that we don't tear away any of those really fragile epithelial cells that are, that are um, growing into the wound every time we change the bandage. Wound dressings include triple antibiotics, steroid cream, hydrogel, manuka honey, and silver sulfadiazine or SSD. I'll touch a little bit on these, but the purpose of this webinar is more bandaging. I will refer anyone who's interested in, um, in further wound dressings. I just listened to the ACVS um, uh, symposium they did it digitally this year because 2020 was a year we couldn't have our conference and a small animal surgeon dr campbell did a really good discussion on that so hopefully kim will let me put in a, a plug for the acvs symposium but i thought it was a wonderful wonderful webinar that's digitally available um to veterinarians should they want to should they want to reference that so moving on uh the image on this slide, if you're looking at this webinar, shows all the parts and parcels to what we use for our routine modified Robert Jones. So firstly, the we usually will, will just lightly clean a wound if it's um, scabbed over at all with some saline and sterile 4 by 4s although if the wound's very clean, I usually don't scrub it. The next thing that you'll see on here is a nonstick pad or a telfa pad. This again is for those wounds that do not produce too much exudate. We usually either keep that pad on because they've got adhesives on either side like a band-aid or we'll put a sterile, sterile roll gauze over the top of that. And then after that comes our sterile cotton combine. And I usually reach for a sterile cotton combine while that wound still um, is relatively fresh if I've done primary closure. Once that, that, um, that wound has gone from inflammatory phase to proliferative phase, so five to seven days if it's granulating well, you can probably reduce the sterility of the, of the bandage material. You still want to keep things clean, but, but not quite so necessary to be absolutely sterile after that wound is closed and the fibrin has closed those wound edges together. We usually use brown gauze followed by vet wrap to, to really stratify the strength of our Robert Jones bandages. Um, and that, that just allows these bandages to be fairly tight. What I'll tell 
students when I'm teaching them how to bandage is when you thump your finger against the side should sound like a, a watermelon. And for the mixed animal practitioners out there, I think that's a major difference between small animal bandaging and large animal bandaging because large animals just don't have the soft tissue that small animals do on their distal limbs. There's much less of a worry of, of cutting off blood supply to the distal limb. And, and so we generally make our bandages far tighter than, than what small animal um, uh, wounds require. And then usually we'll finish up with some elasticon, some, some stretchy uh, water repellent, not quite waterproof, but water repellent tape around the top and the bottom because that sterile cotton combine can really wick moisture up into the bandage if it's left unprotected. So that's again probably a review for most of you out there, but just wanted to to give a base of, of where I'm starting from. Some of the points of contention are to scrub or not to scrub. I already said I'm not much of a scrubber. A lot of the the wound scrubs that we use, chlorhexidine, betadine, will will be deleterious against epithelial cells. So if that wound is clean, I will generally avoid scrubbing. And then Again, many of these sterile items can be replaced with non-sterile items, even a, a quilt um, at, at the owner's, um, uh, if, it, if it's available to the owner once the wound is, is mostly granulated. And I'll show some examples of this in the webinar. So just going through the procedure, um, this is a horse with a pastern laceration, and you can see a non-stick telfa is placed over the wound. This non-stick telfa is, has uh, just a line of adhesive, like a band-aid on either side. That's really nice for some of those horses that stomp their feet. This is generally a part of the bandaging. It seems that the horses resent the most. So we've, we've moved towards these, these non-stick telfas that are non-stick in the middle and then have the adhesives on the side. If you find that the adhesive is really sticky, sometimes it can be, I'll just put, um, some four by fours with saline on the telfa right before I remove it at the next bandage change and that releases some of that adhesive. Uh, the roll gauze to the right is just showing the the wrapping of that nonstick pad if if it doesn't have that that adhesive on it and I usually don't go up or down the leg with this roll gauze because it can constrict a little bit and get tight. I just do it right over the wound. Next comes the, the sterile combine, and this goes around the limb at about the same tightness as a standing wrap, is what I tell owners. The difference is we usually sneak it down to cover the top couple millimeters of the coronary band, because if you don't, the bandage is gonna slide down on its own. And then uh, brown gauze over the top of that, um, and, and fairly robustly on that. I tell my students that they should really only be able to get two fingers in the top and bottom of that bandage in rather, rather snugly after that brown gauze is placed. Just to point out that red vet wrap around the carpus on this horse is just a, a, a um, temporary band-aid over a regional limb perfusion. And then the vet wrap, a major difference in small animal relative to equine bandage is you can see that we've really removed any of the um, of the stretch out of that vet wrap. You can't see any of the lines in that vet wrap as we place it on the bandage and then elasticon at the top and the bottom. Elasticon, if it gets wet, it can constrict a little bit. So I usually place this rather loosely. I pull it off the roll before I place it on a bandage. And I'm usually pretty careful with its use in foals because with that stretchy, delicate foal skin, it can really pull away some of the, the hair on foals and create some, some abrasions due to the elasticon pulling on that skin. Just to point out, um, a nice distal limb bandage, you can still do a regional limb perfusion above that bandage. Um, so that's that's the example given here. You can see that Eschmark tourniquet at the level of the chestnut. We're delivering antibiotics into that vessel there. One thing that I will add on this is if you're doing this on the farm, just cover that bandage with a towel or something because if you get any blood dripping down from your regional limb perfusion, sometimes I've gotten calls from owners and I have to, to um, 
let them know that that was just from the regional limb perfusion, that there was not blood striking through the bandage um, that they're seeing on that medial aspect of the limb. So that's just, again, the, the basis of Robert Jones, modified Robert Jones bandage, the most common distal limb bandage that we use. And here's a, an example of a laceration where it was bandaged with the modified Robert Jones from, from the initial injury through healing. And part of the reason I'm putting up these pictures is because um, this is just an example of a distal limb wound that healed really well with primary closure. So it's one of those unicorns. A lot of them don't do that. Um, this is probably because there were really fastidious owners. It's a relatively clean wound. And the way this horse sustained this laceration, and for those of you who can't see the images, it's a it's a very classic dorsal cannon bone laceration. The horse actually was being ridden and and its left front foot fell into a lead pipe and the horse was incredibly intelligent. He, he still is, he's out there. Um, he uh, allowed the rider to, to get off and extricate himself from the pipe without struggling, um, which I think really saved this horse's life, but it, it ended up that he degloved that dorsal skin from the, from the dorsal cannon. The extensor was was unaffected, which is unusual in some of these dorsal cannon bone lacerations, but this is just a, a um, degloving injury from the, the dorsal cannon bone. So we were able to get a primary closure on this wound. Uh, the image to the right is immediate primary closure using some of those tension relieving suture techniques we talked about in the suturing podcast. So there's some near far far near sutures in there there's some releasing incisions and then there's also a drain placed in in this closure so the times we used a modified robert jones in this stage of healing was for the primary for the primary injury when he was being transported to our hospital for hemostasis and then also to decrease some of the edema that was forming in that wound and then after primary closure to get some compression over that suture line and to protect that suture line. And the from primary closure to about the first two to three days, it's it's pretty important in my opinion for this bandage to be very sterile and sterilely handled because that's before the fibrin clot fills in this laceration. So that wound is is um still not not water resistant. Um, you can still get get significant contamination um, crawling between those edges of wounds if if your your bandage isn't sterile. So moving on to that scary period in any veterinarian's life after closure, that five to seven days post closure. I always tell owners the wound is going to look the best right after we suture it up. I, I'm more worried about dehiscence in that five to seven days post-closure. And as you can see in this image, you there's some granulation tissue filling in those wound edges. Some of those sutures are starting to spread. And there was a big question on if the apex of this wound was going to live or not. Um, so we continued with a modified Robert Jones bandage at this point. This is a stage in bandaging where I'd still put a nonstick telfa over those sutures, but um, I, the owners can transition to, to a quilt at this time with either a polo wrap that you might not get enough compression with a polo wrap, but vet wrap certainly over the top. And when you're talking about bandage expenses, that sterile combine is the most expensive part aside from the elasticon. So using a quilt over that will really decrease expense on this bandage change for the owner. And I, as long as the animal's wearing the bandage well and it's not too effusive, I usually change these bandages after repair every two to three days. So after, after about, um, after two weeks after that laceration, the sutures were removed. And luckily, other than that that apex, the, the wound survived, and the owners transitioned to a standing wrap after suture removal, and it granulated really, really well after that. 
And at this point in the healing, the owners kind of have to know their horse because another horse other than this one may reach down and self-mutilate this wound, but granulation tissue is increased in hypoxic environments. And at least in horses, um, rather than ponies, a bandage will increase the hypoxia, decrease oxygen tension to a wound. So you may get proliferative granulation tissue or proud flesh forming if you keep a bandage on after this point, um, although certainly if it gets infected, then it'll get proliferative as well. So usually what I tell owners is if you can keep the horse on stall rest, if it's a, if it's a horse that wants self-mutilate and you can keep the area clean, this is the time that we can try to leave it unbandaged with careful attention to make sure that that the horse doesn't self-mutilate. Mutilate. And, and this guy did a good job again, really a, a really smart horse and did not bother this granulation tissue. And the next slide I'll show you is, uh, is really what I'm happy with this, this distal limb, which is that wound has contracted the granulation tissue did not get exuberant and the epithelial tissue moved in. And uh, this is seven weeks after the original injury and there's just a little bit of um, hair loss at that apex that we lost just a little bit of epithelium on and this horse is, is back in work at this point. So one of those distal limbs that did well, a lot of them don't, they get exuberant proud flesh and that's probably a topic for a different day. So, that's just a distal limb wound that responded well to, to bandaging techniques. So one of the, the things that I'll really try to do is, is leave that wound unbandaged, at least for some parts of the day, if the granulation tissue bed has moved in. But again, some of these horses may itch at these wounds. So some of the strategies we'll use to prevent horses from irritating an unbandaged wound are cradles, which are wooden um, wooden slats that that um, you can wrap around the neck to keep them from being able to bend their neck to reach at a wound. Of course, you want to keep a, an animal on stall rest with one of these on and, and keep careful attention to them that they don't get caught up anything. Uh, muzzles, grazing muzzles um, can work as well. Sometimes just even giving that horse enrichment so that they're not quite as focused on the wound. So hay nets, jolly balls, any kind of games like that. Um, and then this this horse was one that that really um, she'd irritate the, the granulation tissue, but it was moving in really nicely. So we tried an upside down Elizabethan collar on this horse's carpus. It worked because she was in our hospital and we could monitor her and um, and try to enrich her when she did reach down. But this, this was um, one of those things that I, I didn't work too well and and um, wouldn't recommend for a horse that was that was at a farm and, and unobserved for any amount of time. So going into now a little bit of the strategy of what to do in that really acute wound period and how bandages help out here. Here's an example of that. Um, so this is a wound for um, for which a bandage really helped. This is an edematous wound. It uh, involves the medial aspect of the dorsal cannon bone of the left hind. And this horse did not have an extensor tendon laceration in entirety, but had lacerated enough of the extensor tendon that there was a, a large bulk of tissue on the flap of the laceration that, um, that was pretty edematous. Uh, there was some exposed bone in this horse as well. As we began to debride this laceration, the hemorrhage from the tissue um, and just some of the irritation from our debridement caused it to become even more edematous. So we tried to close this the night of presentation, um, about three hours after the horse had lacerated itself, and just couldn't get a primary closure on this wound because of the edema. So what we did is we put a wet to dry bandage with hypertonic saline um, on the wound and then a, a, com a modified Robert Jones over the top for compression. And this was 
left on for 24 hours. Uh, any longer than 24 hours with a hypertonic saline solution will cause some maceration of the tissue. So we generally recommend leaving it on for only 12 to 24 hours. There's also some suggestion that 7.2% hypertonic saline isn't enough to really draw fluid out of that wound. So I I think it helps, um, but you could argue that some of the some of the um, benefit is conferred by that compressive bandage as much as anything. But this is what the wound looked like 24 hours later. And while you still see exposed bone, um, there's there's much less edema within that flap, and there's the primary closure after after that bandaging. So just a, one of those strategies, if you feel like you can't get a wound closed in the immediate acute period, place a compression bandage, come back the next day, do a delayed primary closure, because that's really uh, helped on some of these wounds that, that really have a lot of tension across that flap to parent tissue. The, um, this is an, a wound that was much older than uh, than the previous one. This is a horse that had an axillary wound that was just a really over a high motion area, did not heal um, really well for, for several months before presentation. And the granulation tissue wound bed is, is beautiful here. Um, uh, definitely needed some, some debridement. Uh, the top layer was infected, but really not too much infect infection over that. But you can see in the right hand picture, granulation tissue just produces a lot of exudate and that exudate can scald the skin below the leg that made this horse really, really reticent to have any work done on this wound because she was just really sensitive from this, this um, granulation tissue um, uh, discharge. So what we did initially is dry packing of the inguinal or axillary region because this wound is so effusive, that dry packing, I usually use cryptorchid packing or an uh, abdominal sponge, um, really make sure you, you count and record how, how many pieces of material you're packing that wound with, um, just to make sure you, you can recover all of it upon removal. But if you pack it with dry material in this effusive of a wound, it acts as a wet to dry bandage, um, which will dry out some of that contamination. Uh, in a hospital environment, this is a wound that would be a candidate for negative pressure wound therapy. Wound vacs are as annoying to our night staff as fluid pumps. They just go off all the time. They, they require a lot of husbandry, the, the wound vacuums do. So it's not generally something that that you can leave a horse overnight with it. They, they've got to have careful attention to them, but they really do a nice job of causing uh, granulation tissue, um, decreasing infection and really promote contraction. So that's this one we would be a candidate for that. However, out in the field, after dry packing of this inguinal axillary region, once that granulation tissue is migrated in a bit more, that's a uh, time to use a calcium alginate dressing. And these are absorbent, dressings that encourage granulation and wound contraction. The calcium alginate, once it's placed, kind of turns into a bit of a gel and, and seems to do a good job of, of um, encouraging wound contraction. And finally, um, on the flip side of, of those effusive wounds, we see a lot of these wounds with exposed bones. So over and over again, one of the most common lacerations we see are horses caught up in high tensile wire and they completely expose their dorsal cannon bone. And these horses have a good prognosis for even return to athleticism. For whatever reason, the extensor tendon um, lacerations don't have, have um, a the fair prognosis of a flexor tendon laceration, they've got a good prognosis, um, even without primary closure of that lacerated tendon. But unfortunately, this exposed bone can really turn into a sequestrum. To try and prevent that, we'll try to, to promote um, rehydration of that surface as much as possible. You can do that with hydrogels, which support an autolytic debridement, granulation, and epithelialization over the top of this. Um, and that hydrogel comes in sprays, gels, or wound topicals. 
Another thing that we've started to use is amnion um, harvested from healthy placentas of, of um, mares and that amnion also has growth factors in it. So, so that's considered um, a, a great way to promote some of that autolytic debridement, granulation, epithelialization, as well as encouraging growth factors in the wound. And there's a couple of protocols on how to harvest this amnion and then how to clean it in these Petri dishes. So that I've gotten the, the freezer downstairs. They've got that blue coloration because of our chlorhex solution um, cleaning protocol. And, um, and those can be found uh, again at the ACVS symposium this year. And then there's also an AAEP um, conference proceedings that talks about that as well. And those are placed over the exposed bone and then underneath a bandage. Granulating granulated wounds. Um, a lot of times I'll just put dry, uh, a, a dry pad on these unless they're incredibly effusive. SSD has been used for a long time. It's an antimicrobial, um, but it, it, um, it's a fairly occlusive ointment, um, so it does it doesn't quite allow oxygenation of that wound. I think I probably you probably understand that I, I really like oxygen to that wound once it's in the granulation stage. A uh, triple antibiotic ointment. Um, uh, again, unless there's a really infected wound that needs debridement, I, I stay away from that. Uh, Panalog, which um, is a corticosteroid ointment with antibiotics in it or something like Panalog um, is pretty darn good for limiting granulation tissue. Um, if there's just a little bit of exuberance of granulation tissue, we'll sometimes apply that just to the edge of a wound that we say is getting a little bit too proud. But as long as the wound is healing appropriately um, and that granulation tissue is appropriate, that wound is meeting its markers for sutures removed 12 to 14 days later and um, there's not a whole lot dying off, a lot of times we'll just use a little bit of Manuka honey. So this is a horse in this photo that really the entire horse other than just the skin of his ventral abdomen made it over a gate. Um, the skin of his ventral abdomen got caught on the bolt on one of those gates and he just he just really ripped off uh, a large flap of skin on his ventral abdomen. So we were able to close this primarily, place a drain, and then um, because there was a, a large pocket there, the sutures held, but they had a little bit of granulation tissue there and the apex of the wound died um, just about three centimeters or so. Uh, at suture removal, so we placed Manuka honey along this, and Manuka honey has been shown to be hyperosmotic. It's an antioxidant and a broad-spectrum antimicrobial, microbial, and it's turning into a, a great wound dressing in human, small animal, and equine cases, so something to consider for those properties. Uh, this is uh, the example of that horse at suture removal where just the little apex of that ventral abdomen flap died off. You can see a little bit of granulation tissue around the outside. In, in no way do I think this granulation tissue is proud. It's not exuberant. It's doing what it's supposed to do and that's, um, that's proliferating before the epithelium can move in. Um, so just put a little bit of Manuka honey on this one. And um, so that was a little bit on what I put under bandages. We'll transition back to bandaging and talk about when a bandage, meaning a modified Robert Jones, isn't enough. And here are three cases where we chose to do something more than just a modified Robert Jones bandage. The case on the left is, a again, a classic dorsal cannon bone laceration, but this horse has completely lacerate his, his extensor tendon. And that extensor tendon, the purpose of this in, in um, ambulation is to allow that horse to put its foot flat on the ground rather than flex the fetlock and walk on the dorsum of the fetlock. So in that case, uh, Robert Jones bandage, um, modified Robert Jones uh, was placed on that with a splint. And I'll show you a photo of that, that splint on the next slide. The horse in the middle, this horse, um, uh, 
had a very small laceration that unfortunately involved all of the superficial flexor, all of the deep flexor, and part of the suspensory um, ligament, which is which luckily this owner was really invested in this horse's care for a long time afterwards. But but that that can be a poor prognosis even with surgical intervention. And this horse we placed in a cast after primary repair of those tendon lacerations because sutures aren't strong enough to hold those those tendons together. And then lastly, on the far right, this is probably the other very common distal limb laceration we see. This is a heel bulb laceration. So heel bulbs um, often require a little bit more coaptation because that purpose of the foot is to spread as that horse bears weight and that can really interfere with wound healing if there's increased strain on those those wind edges. I do want to include the caveat that um, the two horses on the right required surgical intervention at our hospital. The horse on the left had surgical intervention at our hospital um, because he was quite a young guy. That could be managed in the field, although it, it was certainly easier with the, the team we've got at the hospital. But the ones on the right had to have surgery, in my opinion, to survive these injuries, which they both did. So going to that really common dorsal cannon bone laceration, that horse gets caught up in a high tensile fence and really tries to amputate that leg rather than call for help and just have somebody extricate themselves. And we've all seen plenty of these. So if they involve the extensor tendon, then that animal needs a little bit more than a modified Robert Jones to be able to ambulate normally during wound healing. So these animals can either have a modified Robert Jones with a palmar or plantar splint or a bandage cast, which I'll show on the next slide. Uh, these palmar plantar splints, um, I usually use a PVC pipe and I put them down to the ground and then along the the back surface, that flexor surface of the leg, and just over the, the modified Robert Jones and then elasticon or duct tape the whole construct. Uh, these are also really good for lacerations over high motion joints, particularly the dorsal fetlock. And then the splints should be changed or reset once daily, even if the bandage doesn't change. And you can see why in this photo to the right, that splint has rotated to the lateral aspect of this horse's leg. And so every 24 hours, we would just reset it, and make sure that it was right along that plantar surface of this hind leg rather than, than rotated around. Uh, so the, the next horse, that, that horse with the flexor tendon laceration, uh, you can see that that fetlock is severely dropped in these examples of unbandaged, then just with a modified Robert Jones, this horse was sent in in the referring veterinarian's Kimsey splint, and that probably saved this horse's life because it did not have much um, suspensory ligament hanging on, and that um, changes a, a fair prognosis for pasture soundness um, to, to a, a pretty poor to grave prognosis if that suspensory ligament is completely transected, in, in this case without a fetlock arthrodesis. So uh, Kimsey splints are great for, for not only those breakdown injuries on the racetrack, but also some of these severe flexor tendon lacerations. Another thing that can really help, um, help that horse with an extensor tendon laceration, so one where they, they're walking in the dorsum of the fetlock, or really decrease movement on a limb if you're trying to keep wound edges together or bandage cast. So this is an example of a modified Robert Jones. Uh, don't make it too thick because a thick bandage will actually increase the risk of, of bandage sores. But this is just a couple of rolls of cast tape placed over a bandage cast. And these can be left on for uh, three to four days. If you're leaving an animal on the farm with one of these, the owner has got to keep this animal in a stall and has got to check to make sure that this sleeve hasn't migrated up or down um, multiple times a day. Um, but they can be great for in conferring stability to these limbs. So they're easy to place in a field situation on front or hind limbs, and uh, they provide much more stability to the wound for soft tissue injuries such as extensor tendon 
lacerations or for wounds over or the over the the fetlock. They're they're not enough for for fractures or anything like that. Um, but they may be good enough for coapt coaptation prior for referral for those unstable injuries to a surgical facility. And then the other nice thing about them is once you're ready to change that bandage to three to four days, these can be bivalved and cut in two pieces, and then they can be taped back on um, either both pieces or just that palmar plantar piece for, for some of those benefits of the splint that we discussed in the previous slide. Oh, and the, the one other thing I should mention for this is if, um, if it's a distal limb or you're worried about that, that sleeve migrating up, you can incorporate that foot with elasticon to just, uh, to just attempt to keep this sleeve in place over your modified Robert Jones. But again, the owner has got to be cognizant of this, of this fiberglass cast sleeve migrating whatsoever. And lastly, talking about when a bandage isn't enough, um, an example is heel bulb lacerations. We anesthetize that horse in, in the previous slide um, with the heel bulb laceration because she had synovial sites involved. So she had an, an open tendon sheath and an open coffin joint. So she required lavage for that. Regardless, um, Heel bulb lacerations usually heal much better in foot casts. So let me put in my my little slide about um, always ensure that a synovial structure isn't involved with a heel bulb laceration because the coffin joint, the navicular bursa, the pastern, and the tendon sheath are pretty darn close to those those heel bulbs, those collateral cartilages, and otherwise uh, these these heal pretty well with primary closure and a foot cast. So on this slide, I've got an order of operations when assessing wounds for synovial involvement. Um, uh, clip, prepare the wound, perform an arthrocentesis, uh, collect joint fluid for cytology and culture, infuse saline, see if it comes out the wound. If it does, then absolutely gold standard care is lavage of that affected synovial structure. However, if there's no synovial structure involved, um, then hoof casts can be placed on the farm um, as long as the owner is able to keep that horse stalled and monitor that hoof cast um, really well. So for hoof casts, the foot is supposed to flex as of course bears weight. That's, that's what those heel bulbs are supposed to do. They're supposed to spread in a normal horse without an injury. In an injury, that spread of those heel bulbs will detract our wound edges away from each other, which makes primary closure very difficult and healing delayed. So a foot cast will keep that foot from spreading. Um, forelimb casts can easily be placed in standing horses as long as you've got a strong person to hold up that leg while that cast cures. Hind limb casts I usually anesthetize, and that's because if you pick up that hind leg, that foot is going to flex in a different direction from the hock. So those are far more likely to get to get cast sores um, if they're placed standing. So and and once you place that cast, either a forelimb standing or a hind limb anesthetized, when that horse stands up, that foot will sink a bit in the cast. So I always check the backside of the, the cast to make sure that it is not encroaching up in the sesamoids. If it is, I'll cut that down just a bit so that the back of that cast doesn't bite into the sesamoids. Um, and then I leave the, the casts on as long as that horse is walking comfortably and there's no heat swelling discharge. And again, there's no synovial structures involved. I'll leave it on for, for a week to 10 days and then remove it and this is uh, that horse. Um, there's an image of that horse with that laceration. Um, the laceration is mostly healed. There's granulation tissue in, in the wound, so it didn't heal perfectly with sutures in, but enough that we could remove those sutures at 12 to 14 days, and that horse will walk in carefully in that cast. Now, for those of you that are following along with the webinar photos, you can see even though we place that hyaline cast with the horse 
anesthetized, that cast still caused enough um, enough irritation that it rubbed away some of the hair, the white hair around her pastern, and you can see some of that pink inflamed skin. So just foot casts can be can be difficult to place. Um, uh, even with an, an animal anesthetized and should be monitored carefully uh, to make sure that horse stays comfortable in them. Otherwise, they should be removed and checked for cast sores. So that's what I had on wind bandage, particularly in distal limbs. Here's a few examples of horses where I didn't know if they needed a bandage or horses that were um, that didn't have distal limb wounds. Firstly, this is a, a horse that um, tried to fit through a doorway she didn't fit through. Um, and this laceration went through the mus muscles. So she's got uh, that, that flap of skin is closed um, and then some drains, some releasing incisions um, in, in this wound. And this horse was really good, did not mess with her wound at all. So we never bandaged her and, and um, the corner of this died, but she healed, it granulated um, pretty well. So I don't usually put uh, bandages on these pectoral wounds unless the horse really irritates them. Another time I won't use a bandage, but I'll use um, a, a liquid bandage such as Alluspray is for some of these really clean um, lacerations, or this is a, an incision from an ovariectomy. And these alu spray bandages, they won't, they won't um, obviously keep any of the tension away from the wound um, edges, and they won't, um, they won't provide any compression. But they will allow that wound, the wound edges, to be closed and fairly waterproof in that 12 to, that really that 24 to 48 hour period to, before that fibrin clot seals the wound edges, and then. Lastly, that horse that, that scraped off his ventral abdominal skin um, shown here, I was really worried about a seroma forming underneath um, because of the just the location of that wound being on the ventrum. So we placed him in this belly band that we'll often use for, for ventral midline incisions. Um, and he's doing well, can be turned out at home um, in this bandage while that, that heals and Right now, he's still in the granulating stage, so I think that that wound is still about 60 to 80 percent of the original strength, probably more on the 60 percent side. So I'd hate for him to reopen that by scraping his his ventrum. So we're keeping him in a bandage until there's epithelialization of those wound edges. But we also kept him in that bandage immediately after injury to provide compression to prevent seroma formation in that flap. The last wound I want to show you is uh, these photos are courtesy of jo Dr. Joanne Hardy, and this is a wound that an RDVM will actually will absolutely save this horse's life with their bandaging techniques before referral to a hospital. So to orient you in this photo, this horse we're looking at the left thorax. The elbow is to the left, um, the, the caudal aspect of the horse is to the right, and the surgeon is opening up a large thoracic wound with rib fractures that shows that this animal has a pneumothorax. The other way you know he's got a pneumothorax is that there's a catheter and suction inserted to the, the dorsal rib spaces to resolve some of this pneumothorax. And the way this a referring vet can save this animal's life is horses have an incomplete mediastinum, meaning with an acute thoracic wound, if they've got a, a pneumothorax on one side, they're very likely to have a pneumothorax on the other hemithorax. So they may have collapsed lungs on both sides. And so in the acute periods, the RDVM can relieve the, the pneumothorax as shown by this catheter and suction and then place a airproof bandage over the horse's thorax. And that's done in this case with packing material and then a whole lot of saran wrap and elasticon over this horse's thorax. So yes, this horse required debridement, primary closure to surgical referral center, but the, the RDVM acts, absolutely can claim saving this animal's life just by, by how this wound was bandaged up. So just an, an interesting case in that one. That's all I've got for you, and I appreciate your attention today.
Well, that was wonderful and certainly very educational if you want to watch the webinar. But just listening to that was was great, Dr. Gardner. So thank you so much for joining me today. Of course, I, I appreciate all your attention and thank you. And we want to thank our um, our audience for listening and remind you that you can watch the webinar that goes along with this podcast on equimanagement.com's article about this podcast episode. And we also want to give a special thanks to our 2021 sponsor, Merck Animal Health. So please listen and rate episodes of Disease Du Jour on iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, or your favorite podcast platform. And if you have any questions, feel free to send me an email to kbrown, that's the letter K Brown, at equinenetwork.com. Disease Du Jour is a production of the Equine Podcast Network, an entity of the Equine Network, LLC.